Hi, this is Mark Arnold with another Fun Ideas podcast. And today we have an author who has written many books, which we'll discuss in this show. Uh, the author's name is Herbie Pilato. How are you, sir? I'm great. I am feeling terrific. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Okay. Um, how we usually start off is I just ask you a basic question. Tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into writing books and acting and some of the other things you do. Well, I grew up in Rochester, New York, in the inner city, um, all in the 1960s. Always loved TV, always loved um, sci-fi, supernatural fantasy type shows, Bewitched, um, and knew I wanted to somehow be involved with the entertainment industry. So I studied, I was always in plays as a kid. As a matter of fact, I used to do the, what is it, Andy Hardy thing? Hey, let's put on a show in the neighborhood. I was that kid. <laughs> <laughs> there was like a stage, um, a loading dock at this factory that was across the street from our house. And that was our stage in the neighborhood. So anyway, long story short, moved, ended up moving to Los Angeles to pursue acting. We went to UCLA, um, graduated from Nazareth, National College in Rochester. And then I started, um, I decided I wanted to be an NBC page. And that's where I really got interested in behind the scenes type things. Very good. And uh, we'll talk about that. That led to a book, but yes. uh, the first book I want to talk about, uh, which you've written many, but the first one I have, and I think it's the first one you ever wrote, is the Bewitch book. Is that correct? Yes. And well, what good shape that's in. Wow. Yeah, I know. But I have looked at it quite a bit, believe it or not. I just wow. like to keep things nice. But <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um, so how did you go from being an NBC page to doing a book on an ABC show? <laughs> I mean, were you studying to be a writer as well in the background? Or you're just a fan? Or how did it come about? That's such a great question. Um, I always was interested in writing, you know, I never thought of it as a career because I was always such a ham as a kid, you know, but I used to like to write. As a matter of fact, when I did my, um, in senior year at Nazareth College, I was directing plays and you'd have to keep a journal of the, that was part of the, the class, um, part of the credit. So I enjoyed writing about the play more than directing it. So that's kind of where I, you know, I thought maybe things were going. But when I moved to Los Angeles and I started acting on General Hospital and in extra roles and Bold and the Beautiful, um, I broke my toe and I ended up watching TV again because I couldn't do anything, a little toe. And that's when I started watching Bewitched. And then they did a TV movie called I Dream of Genie 15 years later which was a reunion movie of that series. And Jeannie to me was always, and to many people, kind of like a takeoff on Bewitched. And it upset me that they did a reunion movie for Jeannie and not Bewitched. So I wrote a reunion movie for Bewitched. Elizabeth Montgomery didn't want to do it. And then I ended up and go, well, how about we do a book about the, sh the original show? And all of a sudden I became an author. Hmm. So you did answer one of my questions. I mean, oh. did you? I had forgotten. No, that's great. If you do, um, I had forgotten if you had written this prior to Elizabeth Elizabeth Montgomery's passing because oh yes, she passed away a long time ago. So uh, did you actually communicate with her fairly oh, regularly and stuff? Absolutely. Like okay. We did four major interviews. Well, what happened is Bill Asher, who was married to Elizabeth, um, I was in communication with him because he was going to do a new Bewitch show. And it was going to be called Bewitched Again, mm -hmm. where Elizabeth really had agreed to come back as Samantha, mm -hmm. introduce this new witch, and then pop out forever. It was monumental because she was never, you know, I do, I did the reunion and she, she didn't want to do this reunion script, but she was going to do this new show with Bill. Mm -hmm. um, so that fell through. It was going to be done in the UK and the financing fell through. So I had sent Bill, but before that happened, I sent Bill my reunion script, he really liked it. And that's how I, I was gonna be a writer on the new Bewitched. And I had all this Bewitched energy left over. So that's when I ended up doing the Bewitched book. So it was because of Bill that Elizabeth ended up talking with me. Hmm. And uh, you know, I, you know, when I first met her and 
she actually called me at my house, you know, and then he gave me her phone number. Like, why? Well, Elizabeth Montgomery's phone number. Um, but when I first met her, I tripped over the coffee table, very nervous at her house. Bro broke your toe again? <laughs> I did not break my toe again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but that broke the ice is what it did. And uh, she, you know, she said to me, she goes, why are you doing this? You know, why are you writing this book about you? And I explained to her that Bewitch was about true love and that it was about prejudice. And no matter how different two people were, they can still fall in love, blah, blah, blah. Strong work ethic. And she's like, okay. She goes, because Bill told me that I really needed to talk with you. And, and Bill never told me that I needed to talk with anybody. <laughs> so it was really kind of cool. So maybe two. Trying to see what year that was that you did that book. Yeah, uh, I, I met her in 88. Okay. Or excuse me, 89. Okay. And then the book didn't happen until like 92. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm sure, and it may even say in the book, it's been a while since I read the book. That's it, You commented on how pristine this is. Okay. I honestly probably haven't really <laughs> thumbed through it in a while, about five, 10 years. But I have a bunch of TV books. And um, I guess the two questions I would say is why Bewitched? Was it because nobody had done a book about it yet or something else? And the second is why was Elizabeth Montgomery so hesitant to even maybe even talk about it, much less act in a reunion movie when everybody seemed to be doing reunion movies in like the 80s and 90s? Right. Okay, well, I love Bewitched because as a kid, I was picked on and I was bullied. And that show tended to uh, uh, connect with minority groups of all kinds or people who felt isolated. You know, the, the uh, many minority groups, uh, African-Americans in general, uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, connected with the Samantha sense of isolation in the 60s. Uh, the gay community connected with a Samantha's sense of isolation. Um, I was picked on because I was a cute little kid. I used to get beat up all the time because I could sing and dance. So I was always looking for true love anyway. And I was fascinated with the true love between Samantha and Darren. You know, he wanted to, to work and buy her stuff. And she didn't care about that. She didn't care about money. And we never had a lot of money in my house. OK, mm -hmm. so that fascinated me that she was not obsessed with money. Like I had known a lot of relationships to be based on. You know, not all the women I knew in my life were obsessed with money, but a lot of them were. And so I was, you know, really fascinated with the fact that Samantha didn't care about money. She loved this guy for who he was. So there's that. Uh, what was the other question? The other question is just Elizabeth Montgomery herself, why she was hesitant to oh, do yeah. a reunion. It sounds like even until she talked to you, even hesitant of even talking about the character of the show. Yeah. Well, you know, Elizabeth was a complicated person <clears throat> and very, very similar to Mary Tyler Moore, which, you know, I did a, a, a recent book on Mary Tyler Moore, very, very similar. They both had demanding fathers, uh, strict parents uh, who did not want them to be in the entertainment industry. They both felt stereotyped by roles in the 1960s on TV shows, Laura Petrie, Mary Tyler Moore, Mary Richards on the Mary Tyler Moore show, Elizabeth with Bewitched. So she just got, Elizabeth just got tired of twitching her nose. She loved the show. There's this, you know, misconception that she didn't love that show. She loved it. But the, the, the Bill Ash, her marriage to Bill Asher was faltering and the show was faltering because of that. So it kind of just fell apart after the, as the marriage was falling apart and she wanted to move on. And she never really gave interviews anyway. And she was essentially very shy. Mm -hmm. So when she left the witch, she wanted to do something so different, which she ended up doing with movies like A Case of Rape mm -hmm. and The Legend of Lizzie Borden. So she was like done. But when I got to talk with her, you know, Nick at Night was coming into the world. <laughs> Retro TV was coming to be a big thing. And she, I helped her come out of her shell a little bit. You know, I made her realize that people still loved her in 1988, 89, as much as they did in 1964, 69. Yeah. And, and she really got that, which was really nice. 
Um, Because she had not talked with Dick Sargent, she had not talked with Dick York, she had not talked with David White, and all these people started coming back into her life because of me, Hmm. you know, (laughs) and that was really cool. Okay, so um, overall, did you get the impression, even if later years she didn't want to talk about it, that she had a a good time doing the show while it was on the air? She absolutely had a good time. Um, She always said it was an education um for her in in television even though she did like 200 you know tv guest spots before bewitched on twilight zone the untouchable 77 sunset strip on and on and on whatever was on in tv before then she did it Mm -hmm. um but samantha was who she really kind of was i mean you watch people say what was she like what was she like watch samantha that's who Elizabeth was. That was her. She was. She brought her down to earth personality into that part, and she made people. I always say this: like and believe in witches because she made witches so likable and believable. In in a sense, that's actually refreshing to hear. You know, so what you see is what you get when you watch the show. It's like she's not like belittling the show, saying, "Oh, this is some cheesy magic show," and it's like, "Yeah, with, uh, dumb special effects and stuff or something." You know, like it, first of all, it was none of those things. Oh, I know that, but it's <laughs> a non-fan may say that. that. <laughs> no, people think that. You know, yeah. people think that who don't watch it, just like they think, you know, oh, TV, uh, TV fifty sitcoms and family sitcoms were so silly. Well, no, Father Knows Best was freaking brilliant. Right. Uh, Ozzie and Harriet, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, was so far ahead of its time, <laughs> as far as you know, the whole Seinfeld show about nothing thing. Yeah. And it was very sophisticated humor. So those kinds of comments when people say, "Oh, it was just silly little magic show," or "Oh, it was just smarmy," you know, fifty sitcom, they never watched the shows. Right. Bewitched was about true love. Yeah. It was again about strong work ethic. It was about prejudice. And it was written like little half hour movies. You had people like Bernard Slade, who went on to do the same time next year. Danny Arnold, who went on to do um, um, Barney Miller. You know, top notch writers who wrote whatever happened in that world, that bewitched world made sense. Whatever happened in that world. If Samantha put a spell on somebody, only Samantha could take it off. You yep. know, all the witches they had last names and or their first names were ended in A. I mean, there was a logic to all of that, you know. Yeah. It's funny to me, and I'll just uh, see if you if you agree or disagree, it doesn't really matter. It's your opinion. Um, people always compare it to I Dream a Genie, of course, you know, and uh, I always say this. I mean, it is similar because it does have magic elements and things like that. But I mean, one thing I've always noticed on Bewitch compared to I Dream a Genie is I uh, bewitch uh, Samantha really loved her husband and was willing to forego all her magical capabilities in order to keep the peace and wanted you know peace and harmony because she loved him so much. It wasn't really that he was that she was subservient to him, although people always say that. Um, I think there's like an element of true love. In the case of I Dream a Genie. It's almost like, you know, it, they say the same thing about that, but I don't think she was subservient there either because half the time, on, in fact, most of the time, she ignored what <laughs> Major Nelson said and just did it anyway. And they weren't married either. So until the very end, you know, so it, it, it is different in that way. So I'm just wondering what your take side or uh, on the two shows. Since- well, first of all, I love I.G. Magini. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it was a fun show. Bar reading, beautiful, gorgeous. Um, and just full of one, she's just one big bubble. <laughs> so I don't watch her, just full of life. But it was very different than Bewitched. It was not a sophisticated comedy like Bewitched was. Bewitched, there was something else going on. Now, Elizabeth wasn't all that crazy about the fact that they started doing IG Magini, and it happened for several different reasons. You know, Sidney Sheldon, who created IG Magini, was good friends with Bill Asher. Mm-hmm. Um, they did work together on the Patty Duke show, which Bill Asher directed. Mm-hmm. So when Bewitched was such a hit, NBC went to Saul Sachs, who created Bewitched with Harry Ackerman, by the way. Mm-hmm. And he's and they said, could you do another witch show? And Saul Sachs says, I don't want to do another witch show. <laughs> 
So that's when they went to Sidney Sheldon. And Sidney Sheldon, before he created Genie, he went up to Bill and had dinner with Bill and Elizabeth and said, do you mind if I do this show about a Genie? And Bill didn't care. Elizabeth was like, well, I kind of do mind, you know? <laughs> Especially when they started doing, well, if I do the, the blink, if we have Genie do the blink, like Elizabeth, Samantha does the twitch, you know, that really upset her. And then when they started doing the dark haired Genie sister <laughs> to the dark haired Samantha's cousin Serena, both played by, you know, Elizabeth, just like Barbie, that really upset Elizabeth. Mm. Um, but the shows were, were different and um, if that was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, Bewitched lasted longer than, it started before Jeannie and it lasted longer than right. Jeannie. Right. Um, but, you know, it's really in one way apples and oranges and, mm -hmm. you know, there's fans who love both and yeah. you don't want to distance anyone. Um, but, you know, I'm always obviously just gonna love yeah. love bewitched but it, it was kind of the the what's the word uh the the times you know the something of the times i can't think of the exact word but you know to have more fantasy elements in your sitcoms because in the 50s they were pretty straightforward you know uh like ozzy and harriet you know if you're just thinking about it it's poor mother father in that case two sons sometimes they'd have two daughters or you know a, a son and a daughter like Danny Thomas show but it was pretty much there wasn't anything beyond the core family and that's it so yeah something had to give where they had to do something beyond just the core family thing after a while well and, yeah yes well first of all you know getting back to the subservient thing yeah. okay that really upsets me when people say that yeah, about a lot of people oh do. this bewitch is so subservient yeah. please yeah. this woman okay it was her choice yes it was her choice to live as a mortal darren wasn't forcing her to do nothing she came to earth looking for something different and you know what first of all being a housewife my mom god bless her, was a housewife one of the hardest working people i ever knew in my life yeah. So taking care of the house and staying home is no easy job. And any housewife or house husband will tell you that. So number that's that's number one. Right. Um, the magic element allowed the witch, just like the science fiction element allowed Twilight Zone and Star Trek mm -hmm. to address issues of the time that could not necessarily be addressed. Not that's to true. mention that Samantha and Darren were, were one of the first couples who slept in the same bed ozzy and harriet did by the way right um but samantha and darren did and it was okay because she really wasn't human she was yeah. a witch yeah. so it's okay for darren to sleep with a witch but not with a woman yeah so, I, I think that the rule was on like ozzy and harriet and, I, and actually I, I noticed that recently because i have been watching ozzy and harriet and i consulted some other tv historians and they go well, there's this show that's even predates that, that there, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. But in the case of that show and Ozzy and Harriet, they were married couples in real life. So yes. by the 60s, if somebody says the Flintstones, even though it was a cartoon, the Munsters, well, they were monsters, you know. Yes. And, and even yes. when you go to the Brady Bunch, it's like, well, it was still considered okay because you know she they were widows or something to that effect or, you know they always have some rule it's like i don't know if they've ever gotten past it on television <laughs> yes there was that for, i know that that sitcom the first sitcom in tv actually they were played i can't think of their name the name of it but they were real life this is before yeah. i love lucy yeah. they were real life couples a couple so it was okay for them to sleep in the same bed yeah and now, i had just learned that I didn't know yes. that you know, about that show. Of course, there's no copies of Survived, apparently. So, you know, that's why I didn't know about it. Yeah. But look at Lucy, Lu Lucy and Desi. They were married and they still couldn't sleep in the yeah. same bed. Now, in that case, I don't know if you would agree, but um, I I, I kind of think that there's a little bit of, for lack of a better term, like a prejudice going on, even though Lucy and Desi were really married. I mean, uh, I've read that, you know, they, they didn't want to cast Desi because... Who would believe that Lucille Ball is married to this Cuban guy? And she, and she was and had been married for quite some time to him at the time. You know, and it's kind of ridiculous how they were hesitant to do it. You know? he, yes. And she, you know, she, I guess another man, and, and you might know the name, 
played uh, her husband on My Favorite Husband on radio, and they just wanted to bring him to the show. And she's like, no, I want my own husband to play, you know? And it, it, it ended up being a monumental moment, obviously, yeah. in, in TV history where he became the first um, minority to, to star in a sitcom. And, and you know, they kind of made a joke of it, which was the only way they could probably deal with it at the time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, obviously, I mean, come on. When Nicole Kidman's doing the new movie, they're doing a big documentary that's going to be directed by Ron Howard. Everybody loves Lucy. Yes. <laughs> Everybody. Um, a few more Bewitched questions, and then I'm going to go on to the uh, other books you've written. But um, Bewitched obviously had a cast change in 69 or 68. Was it? I forgot which year, but... Um, and it went in the fifth season to the sixth season, and it went from Dick York to Dick Sargent. And the reasons given, I believe, were he was having severe back problems, but they weren't so severe that he couldn't have come back. What is kind of the real story that you uncovered while you were doing your research about that, about why he left the show? Yeah. Um, okay. Dick York started the show. He was terrific. But before he began the move, or before he began the show, he did a movie called They Came to Cadora. And he hurt his back. He was doing a, a railroad scene on a railroad cart, you know, like in Petticoat Junction. You see. Right. <laughs> and the director yelled, cut. And he was doing the scene with another actor. The other actor let go of the cart. He didn't, and he wrenched his back. So he never recovered from that injury. And he started taking painkillers and he became addicted to those painkillers. And he would, he, he, he would uh, miss episodes of the show. He did like 14 of episodes that he missed. And then one day he had a seizure and he broke down in the set and they had to rush him to the hospital. And Bill Asher's like, you know, went to the hospital and said, Dick, do you want to leave the show? And it was Dick's decision to leave. But he regretted it later because he felt um, that all he needed was that summer to rest up and he would have been able to finish the run. But because of the type of Dick, person Dick York was, he was thinking about everybody connected with that show and they didn't want, he didn't want them to lose their job. So he thought quitting would, you know, save everybody the aggravation. And he was just a tremendous person. It was all very sad. And Dick Sargent did a tremendous job mm -hmm. as being the second Darren. There's no easy feat. And he was actually, from what he told me, he was approached to play Darren before Dick York, but he was under contract with Universal and he couldn't do it. And Tammy Grimes was supposed to be Samantha, but she <laughs> said no. And then they, those two ended up doing the Tammy Grimes show, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> Um, now, uh, why or was there any consideration at the time when Dick Dork made that decision to just end the show? Like, you know, you had five years. Elizabeth there. wanted to end it. She was she was done in the fifth season. Oh, okay. And and having Dick York leave was kind of like an impetus for say, okay, look, let's just forget it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But Bill Asher wanted to continue, mm -hmm. you know, with the show. And ABC wanted her to continue with the show. Yeah. So they took those 14 episodes without Dick York and they reran it that summer so that Darren's presence would not be there. So that when they had the new Darren, it's like no one was going to notice. Well, people, of course, did notice. The show dropped out of the top 10, never went back into the top 10. It, it, the ratings fell. And by the seventh season, you know, they tried to, you know, they went to Salem for like an arc of episodes at the witches convention and they really went on location. And then in the eighth year, they tried to go to Europe, although they didn't go to Europe, really. They just pretended to go to Europe, but nothing was helping it. And if you look at that eighth year, Elizabeth is just like, you know, dragging her feet, you know, just going <laughs> braless. She didn't care, you know. <laughs> Well, and the cool thing is she parted her hair in the middle, yeah, so it, well, yeah. she looks different than she had in previous yeah. seasons. So. Which was good and bad, because people <laughs> like to have a certain look. She yeah. always changed her hair somehow on the show, True. but that was radical. And Marlo yeah. Thomas did the same thing on that girl, right? If you recall that last season. Yeah. Um, but Elizabeth made a conscious effort to make a, a different hairstyle. She told me that. 
every year. But then last year, you know, the bit and the ash from marriage was falling apart, yeah. you know, too. That was the other thing. Um, uh, it was it was just everybody was worn out. She was tired. The show was not the same anymore. It wasn't what it used to be. The marriage wasn't what it used to be, the Bill Asher, Elizabeth Montgomery marriage. It was just time. Now, didn't they even want a ninth season and then they, they ended did. up giving it, it was, to Paul Lind? Yeah. It, re, it was renewed for a ninth year. And yes, it ended up, Bill Asher ended up uh, doing the Paul, or temperatures rising yeah. uh, in the Paul Lind show as part of that contract to make up for it. And Elizabeth ended up doing the victim and Mrs. Sundance uh, mm. with her contract um, that to, to make up for that ninth season. Mm. And then, you know, she wanted to do The Legend of Lizzie Borden too. But it was a case of rape with NBC that right. really uh, made her first big mark. Yeah. Didn't she do a movie, if I'm thinking correctly, for Hannah Barbera's live action movie? Oh, Bell Star or something like that too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bell Star. No, what it was live action. Absolutely, yeah. it was to me. That's her my favorite of her of her <laughs> TV movies. It is yeah. terrific. She is beautiful in it. Uh, she's uh, so real. The mm. cinematography is very. Remember the what was it? The Clint Eastwood movie Unforgiven, where they mm. muted everything. First of all, Kung Fu did that first. Yeah. <laughs> but but Bell Star did the script. Oh, it was beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful film. Yeah, I was impressed. I don't think I saw it originally. I mean, I was a bit young when uh, Bewitched went off the air. I think I was like five years old. And I think that came out shortly after, if I remember, a year or two it after. It was 76. Okay. I was still pretty young. You know, I was like nine or something. And I don't know. It just didn't interest me. So I never saw it. And then later I saw it and I go, this isn't bad, you know? And, you know, it's like, I, I assume uh, that she got the role because she was already friendly with Hanna-Barbera because she had done that Flintstones episode and they also did the animation for the opening titles or did that not have anything to do with it? Well, it's not like they were best friends or anything yeah. like that. Um, I She probably just did it because she loved the script. Okay. And it just so happened to be Anna Barbera. And Dick York told me with that uh, that Flintstones episode that he didn't get paid for it. He didn't get a check. He got a TV. Wow. <laughs> That's got funny. a color TV. <laughs> with, with a rock facade. Or, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, transitioning, since you mentioned Kung Fu, that is one of your other books. This is a little more beat up. I got a big crease on it on the book down here. Whoops. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on your that's the, And that's anyway. the second edition of that book. Oh, okay. I didn't know because I just bought it somewhere along the line. And I go, oh, it's by the same guy, you know, because I always <laughs> I, I always pay attention to these type of books because I love these type of books. Steve Cox wrote a bunch of them. Uh, I can't remember the other author. I've written a couple of them, not really on TV shows, but more on cartoons and animation. But, you know, these type of books... Were got was what got me to, to be interested in writing books. I said, I like this type of stuff. This is the type of book, and this one too, would be books that I would write. And your $6 million man book and things like that. You know, it's like, so it's just a matter of which show do you pick? There we go. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. But, um, Kung Fu was a show that, you know, I didn't watch every week, uh, but, you know, I watched it periodically. You know, it was good. But um, what was your attraction to it? And what, why the book? In fact, you wrote two books, I think, on Kung Fu. Yep. Yep. Um, well, first of all, to Bart Andrews, the I Love Lucy book, he it was my first agent. And I had contacted him because I'm like, if I want to do a book about the witch, I want to do it like this guy did about I Love Lucy. So I yeah, ended up contacting him. <laughs> so the excellent book. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking to continue the theme of Bewitched. Mm -hmm. Bewitched was about a witch in a mortal world. Um, David Carradine as Kwa Chang Kane was an Asian in a Western world. So again, mm -hmm. the theme of prejudice came up, but I had always loved Kung Fu as a kid. I'm, I remember watching and going, what is this? How did this get on the air? You know, I've mm -hmm. always been a spiritual person. I mean, I was raised a Catholic, left it, then I came back to it, realizing that it's that's what I'm supposed to be in this world in this life as a Catholic, mm -hmm. and that's okay. And mm -hmm. I'm not pressuring people to be Catholics or mm -hmm. whatever. I respect all religions. Let me make that clear. God comes to us as we believe God to be. 
Um, but I was always spiritual, so I just, I just was, I loved, I loved dancing too. And David Carradine was a dancer. And I remember him telling me that to be, a, to do martial arts, you have to be a good dancer. And he got the job because he was a good dancer. Hmm. So I, I like the way, you know, the, the martial arts thing, everybody was kung fu fighting. We all remember <laughs> that song, right? Yeah. So there's just so many different reasons. And it was hypnotic to me. You know, I loved that he was a man of peace. You know, I'm a man of peace. You know, I was always a man of peace. And I guess, yeah, too, again, the beating up, getting beat up as a kid thing. You know, I was trying to, you know, get my bearings and toughen up a little bit and to learn to defend myself. So that was a part of it. But mostly when I, I wrote the book years later, it was because I wanted to continue the theme of prejudice, which really is in the Bionic book as well, Stephen Jamie were very uh, felt isolated, right. different. They were part man or part machine and part human. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, the peak of the prejudice was my life goes on book. You know, Corky, God bless Corky, yeah. Chris Burke, who had Down syndrome. Right. And he's playing a character who had Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. This show did for TV what no show, excuse me, what did for dis those with disabilities what no show ever did. It was the first show to have a weekly character yeah. um, who had a disability. L um, what was it? Facts of Life with Jerry Jewell. She yeah. was a, a periodic guest character. Yeah. Um, she was amazing. She's a, an amazing person. Right. Um, she has, has cerebral palsy. But Chris Burke did it on a weekly basis. That's a star. So it's just, yeah. just yeah. amazing. Yep. So um, now did you write... Well, actually, let me go back to the Bewitch. So you did uh, Bewitch book. Um, was that revised and updated, or yeah. is it the same book, or is it a different book? Okay, I did. I did the Bewitch book in 1992. Okay. Then I rewrote it as Bewitch Forever when Elizabeth okay. died. Okay, and then I, there was a couple revised editions when I. Then they did the 40th anniversary, or the yeah, the 40th anniversary. Uh, when they re released the Bewitched feature film with Nicole Kidman. So I revised it again. Okay. And then I did Twitch Upon a Star. The that's, yeah, that's another one. That, so that one's a biography of... That's a biography of Elizabeth. Right. And then I did The Essential Elizabeth Montgomery, which is an encyclopedia of all of her work. Okay. I didn't know you did that. <laughs> wow. Yep. I'll have to seek these out. Now on Kung Fu, going back to that, there's a Kung Fu Book of Cain and the Kung Fu Book of Wisdom. Yes. Now, what's the difference on it? This one's the Book of Cain, the one I held up, which right. I got because I was like the ones that basically history of the show, interviews, episode guide. That's what I tend to like. You know, yeah. I, that's the in a nutshell, generally. Yes. yes. <laughs> Excuse me. me how does the Book too. of Wisdom uh, differ? Well, the Kung Fu Book of Wisdom was really supposed to be a part of the Kung Fu Book of Cain. The Kung mm -hmm. Fu Book of Wisdom is essentially it takes all the wisdom of the show. And it uh, divides it on, under topics like love, fortune, peace. And it, it, and, and it takes all the different quotes that Cain said and his master, Master's Poe and Master Khan in the show and breaks it down and divides it into categories. So it was really supposed to be an appendix hmm. to the Kung Fu Book of Cain. But my publishers were like, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just do the Kung Fu Book of Wisdom as a separate little book? It's like a five by seven hardcover. And uh, and we can do a sequel, so that's very cool. Yep. Well, I mean, I did two books on the monkeys, so I guess people can do two books. You've done many books on Bewitched, like you said. Um, now, um, is Kung Fu? I it's been a while since I read that one too. I mean, I have all these books on the shelf, but you know, forgive me that I haven't read it in a while. Did no it problem. come out of uh, the like Bruce Lee becoming a star in the early seventies, okay. or is it totally? Devoid, divorced from that. All right, it's very controversial. I'm going to set the record straight All right. <laughs> again because I've, I'm, I'm yeah, that's why I ask record. these things because this is, you know, yeah. the, uh, the rumors, the, 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 everything that everybody always thinks, you know, okay. that are not necessarily true. It, correct. All right, here's what happened Ed Spielman and Howard Friedlander wrote Kung Fu, the script, in 1966. Okay, it was supposed to be a feature film. They brought it to Warner Brothers. They bought Warner Brothers bought it, but did nothing with it. 
1970, everybody's 71 ish, everybody's you know going crazy with the martial arts. Warner Brothers says, Hey, let's put this on TV. Now, simultaneously, Bruce Lee is doing his thing. Yep. Okay, he created this show about um, you know, this uh Asian uh, monk or whatever, and it was similar, but it was not. He did not create Kung Fu. Ed Spielman and Howard Friedlander created Kung Fu in the 60s, all right? Mm -hmm. Bruce Lee did his thing and he, to, and he, and, you know, in the, in the early 70s. He auditioned for Kung Fu, mm -hmm. okay? He was considered too tough for the mm -hmm. role. They wanted wow. someone more subtle, more calmer, okay, different, okay? It was, a, always, it was always a half American, half Asian character. It was always a half Asian, half American character, okay? Mm -hmm. So then Bruce Lee was upset that he didn't get the part. He takes off to China and he becomes a superstar and does his own movies. So <laughs> it is because of the rejection from Kung Fu, which he did not create, yeah. It was created decades before, a decade before, all right, right. by Ed Spielman and other, but it was because of his rejection from Kung Fu that he became a martial arts icon in the movies. Wow. And that's <laughs> the story. Okay. Because I have heard the parts of that, but not the complete part. Uh, I have heard that Bruce Lee auditioned for it, but I didn't he know did. that the script uh, dated back to the mid 60s and things like that. So. Right. That's, and I, I also you know, want to say it may have said that in here, but, you know, I forget, you know, that's your domain. Okay. That's why I'm asking you these things. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and everybody said that David, you know, David Kerrigan was was um, obviously he was a white American. And you know, there was a big stink about it now, probably more than then. But sure. the bottom line is the, the world was not ready for an right. Asian American actor in the lead. So he paved the way, but yeah. Guy Lee, who was an Asian American casting director in the 60s and 70s, who cast every Asian American actor in every role, he mm -hmm. worked on Kung Fu in, in casting every supporting player as, a, as an Asian actor. That show did more for Asian American actors than any show before it. It broke the stereotype. Yeah. It could not have happened if there was an Asian American in the lead. It's just the way it was. Okay. Right. Now it's different, but Kung Fu broke really so yeah. many ground was groundbreaking in, 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 in introducing the world to new age, first of all, introducing the world, uh, the mainstream world to China yeah. as President Nixon is holding historic talks with chairman True. Mao. Never thought about so, it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, I get very defensive when people start right, right. Kung Fu. And you know, some some actual Asian Americans did, you know, appear in roles like Key Luke, you know, and other uh -huh. people, you know. So it, it didn't it didn't shout out everybody, you know, it's ben, like it's, no it's way unfortunate it, about Bruce Lee, but if he was rejected but for he the didn't reason get the you part, say that it, makes he sense. didn't get the he didn't get the part because he he was Asian. He didn't get yeah. the he, he didn't get the part because he was too tough. Yeah. Okay. And that makes sense because you want a kind of a mellow role. Now one could argue, well, why didn't they get a mellow Asian actor? Well, you know, it, was <laughs> you know. it just wasn't gonna happen. It was and I can understand that everybody was upset, or the people who yeah. were upset. But we have to keep things in context when we right. talk about these things. Yeah. We have to be fair. Right. And we can't just say that Kung Fu was an atrocity. It was not an atrocity. Right. It helped now, him. was um, Bruce Lee considered because he was on the Green Hornet? Was that the reason why he was up? Or did it have anything to do with the Green Hornet? Just because he had a co-starring role on that show? He had, see, you know, he made it as a co-star because he was a co-star on Green Hornet. So that right. worked. Okay. And he did it on Longstreet, you know, because he, he, was, he was on Longstreet as a, a semi-regular. But it just wasn't going to happen as the lead. But I mean, is that why they tested him and tried him out? Well, I'm, yeah, yeah, he was an ABC because he had favorite. those at least co-starring roles. Yeah, okay. He was an ABC favorite. Both yeah. um, Green Hornet and Longstreet were ABC shows. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, moving on, and it is interesting. All your books do have a theme, and I never really thought about it. Now, I mean, if for lack of a better term, I guess you could say kind of fish out of water or uh, you know, something different about the situation than the average situation or something like that to describe something. Um, 
So um, as a kid, I love Six Million Dollar Man. I love the Bionic Woman more. I don't have the book with me, but I have the book. And that's why, you know, you're going to have to hold it up. But I love that book. But one thing I read in doing my research, this was not an automatic go for being published, which is odd to me because, I mean, uh, is that correct? It took about 15 years to get this book published. And why? what happened there? You know what? <laughs> Sometimes publishers don't know nothing. <laughs> Sorry, but the way I always looked at it is any TV show that was on the air for more than five years has a built in readership that all that needs to be tapped is through a strong promotional campaign. So publishing is a very objective industry. I had 100 rejections on the Bewitched book. Mm. It was purchased and then it was canceled. Nope. It was purchased again after 50 other rejections and it was canceled again. So it, it, people do in publishing what they want to do. You know, if the editor likes the book, great, they'll buy it. If the editor's having a bad coffee day or a bad hair day <laughs> and, the, you, and your proposal comes across her desk, eh, I don't want to do it. I don't know it. I mean, it's, it's the least objective industry in the world. Yeah. So instead of just thinking outside the box, they think, oh, no one cares about classic TV shows. Nobody cares about the $6 million man. Nobody cares about Life Goes On. Nobody cares about Bewitched. Nobody mm -hmm. cares about Kung Fu. And all you do is look today, and everybody loves classic TV. Right. Nine billion people watched William Shatner go into space, Captain Kirk. Right. Um, so, you know... It all depends on who buys the book, who believes in the book, mm -hmm. um, and how much money they put in to promote the book. Nobody's going to buy any book if nobody knows about it. But I guarantee you, if I had a um, million dollar promotional campaign behind any one of my books, they would have all been bestsellers. Mm -hmm. They've done well. Don't get me wrong. I've yeah. been very happy that Twitch Upon a Star became the fastest selling new title in my publisher's history when it was first published in 2012. Hmm. Um, but they've, have they sold 75,000 copies, 100,000 copies, 200? No, but that's not, that, that's not because the market isn't there. It's because the market is, has not been properly tapped. Yeah. Oh, I still get people to this day. Wow, you wrote a book about underdog and Tennessee tuxedo. <laughs> Can I buy it? Yeah, it came out in 2009. Where were you? I have my second one out now. Oh, really? I'll buy it. You know, it's like, go figure. I mean, I tried my hardest, but I, I'm like you. I don't have the biggest promotional budget. I don't have any budget. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it, it takes time. So, I mean, you probably have done better than me in that regard. You probably, you know, you've gotten into regular bookstores and you know, probably done a lot more signings and stuff than me, but you know, it's, hey. it's but it's it's still it you know it still hasn't been easy because to, in publishing today you're either you have to write something political or yeah. you have to write something you have to be an A list celebrity. They yeah. you know publishers tend not to care about the B and the C list, which is sad. So instead yeah. of spending ten million dollars in advance on some major celebrity that usually their book is going to bomb and it ends up in returns. At yeah. the dollar store, instead of spending ten, spending ten million dollars, how about spreading the love a little bit yeah, with the yeah. B list and the C list, and get <laughs> seventy five thousand here, eighty thousand there to these B listers, and build a strong big list? Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I know you. <laughs> you don't have to tell me you're preaching to the choir here, but um, going back to, uh, I, I didn't ask this on Kung Fu, but I'll say it. You know. It didn't seem like uh, David Carradine was upset in playing Kane because he came back later um, in a sequel show in, in the 90s, unless he was just doing it. I'm broke. I need to do this. And I'm desperate. Or did he actually really enjoy the character and want to revisit it? He loved Kung Fu just like Elizabeth loved the witch. OK, okay. Um, but the, the three years, he always said all he ever wanted to do was three years. No. So the show ended, you know, and in that last season, ABC threw whatever they could up against All in the Family, even Bewitched, and it wasn't happening. 
Same thing with Kung Fu. They threw Kung Fu up against all the family. The show just died. But it had a final episode, which was kind of unique for the time. Uh, Kane really finds his brother in the end. That was part of the quest or part of the, the premise. Um, but years later, yes, he did Kung Fu, the movie, that reunion movie. But if you watch it closely, you can see him smirking through it, you know. <laughs> and it's like, God, David, could you please stay in character? And and then they did it, what was it, in 90, 94, 95, they did, um, or 92, uh, Kung Fu, The Legend Continues. Yeah. And that was a good show, too, but it was modernized. Yeah. It was in contemporary time. and. I don't know. And then I'm no fan of the new Kung Fu that they just did last year on the CW. I don't think it's on anymore. Yeah. But, you know, they made it contemporary. And the way, I'm no fan of TV today anyway. Yeah. You know, because everything is yeah. so violent and vulgar and, yeah. you know, they don't give the, the actors chance to act. It, yeah. It's just, it's just. Yeah, I guy. see some of your uh, posts on Facebook, but I agree with you. You know, you talk about the writing, you know, why can't they write it this way? You know, and it's like, I agree with you 100%. I mean, I, I've just decided, you know, I'm aware of current shows, but most of the time when somebody recommends a current show, I just kind of file it away in my memory bank. But meanwhile, I'm watching more episodes of My Mother the Car, you know, or something like that. I'm just making Which is it up. not as bad as it is. No, in fact, that. and that's not really a joke. I actually have been watching them because... I wasn't even alive when that show originally aired and they never showed it in reruns. And it does have the same fantasy type elements as what we're talking about with Bewitched and stuff like that. And then but, I go, there's some really crazy episodes here if you really want to delve into all 30 but episodes. You see, the only thing about my mother, the car, and again, this would not make it in the, lo in the illogical world of Bewitched's logic. Yeah. My mother, the car, if you're going to die, and you're going to come back. A spirit cannot come back to a thing. If, if, they, <laughs> if they said it was my mother, the giraffe, that would have worked because the yeah. giraffe is uh, alive. But a car is a dead thing. I know. I guess they were making the assumption you could uh, forego logic so much that, you know, because people love their cars and they think that, <laughs> them is in the, you know, I get it. I don't know. The, the thing I find fascinating, and I'll get off my mother the car, but I have to say this because I don't know if you've noticed this. The people that did my mother the car prior to that worked on Rocky and Bullwinkle. Afterwards, worked on Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> you, know, you know, and it's like, how did this dog get in the middle between these two? It's true. It's <laughs> true. <Legendary. laughs> it's true. Yeah, I think even I think Chris Beard or somebody from the Sunny and Share show too. Yeah. It worked on mother the my mother the car. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and even the actors kind of eventually lived it down. Jerry Van Dyke finally got on coach and uh Avery Schreiber <laughs> got to be reteamed well, with Burns and Schreiber. They had a couple successful albums and TV shows and stuff. So yeah, yeah poor <laughs> Jerry. Well, Jerry Van Dyke. I mean, living in Dick Van Dyke's shadow, that that yeah. must have been tough. Yeah. You know? But anyway, okay, so I did mention Six Million Dollar Man and Bionic Woman, so let's yes. go there. Um, I've always been under the impression that Lee Majors did not like doing that show. Is that correct? Or did he just want to continue on, you know, doing other things? Because obviously he did Big Valley prior and he did Fall Guy after and uh, things like that. And so... It, you know, he, he gives, and he did do a reunion movie, you know, but it always, he always struck me as not really enjoying it that much, you know, and I uh, could be no, totally no, that, wrong on that, you know. That's, no, that's not true. That's yeah. not true. He was thrilled because he went from what? Fifth Banana or on, on Big Valley to Virginian. I think he did the Virginian. Yeah. A third Banana, then he was second Banana on Owen Marshall. Yeah. So then he finally got to be top banana on Six Million Dollar Man. So he was thrilled. He yeah. loved it. Okay. You know, I, I think there were some issues when Lin Lindsay Wagner came al along because she was just, you know, she just stole the show. Yeah, because I loved her show. I, I love it more than Six Million Dollar Man. I almost, when DVDs started coming out, I, I bought Bionic Woman right away. And I said, I really want Six Million Dollar Man. He's such a, he's such a <laughs> well, no, sourpuss. And then I, I started watching him again and I go, 
no, that's a pretty good show. You know, it's like I like. No, it. they're 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 both good shows, and and yeah. they're yeah. Lee and Lindsay love each other today too. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to give that impression as well. But yeah. you know, the poor guy he was he finally gets a hit show, and and this amazing actress comes along who's just a natural beauty. You know, she and she's such an, uh, a down to earth. She always reminded me of Samantha too. And she just knocked everybody's, you know, socks off. And she dies in the show. Right. And, you know, on the but the Bionic Woman dies, you know, at the end of a two-part episode of The Six Million Dollar Man. Everybody freaks out at home, says, bring back Jamie. Yeah. They bring her back for a second two-parter, The Return of the Bionic Woman. Yeah. And the ratings go through the roof and they give her her own show. Right. Um, so they did the crossovers for a while. But then... You know, Wonder Woman came on ABC at the same time. And all of a sudden, ABC has two Supergirls, right? Right. And they're like, what do we do? What do we do? So they ended up canceling both. Um, Wonder Woman went to CBS. Bionic Woman went to NBC. And Lee Majors was not going to be an ABC star was not going to go on an NBC show. Now, no, the crossover episodes were over. Lindsay wasn't going to come from NBC to ABC, but Oscar Gold. Yeah, he was on both. I always thought that was interesting at the time. <laughs> Richard Anderson, yeah. the only actor in TV history that I can think of who played the same character on two different shows on two different networks. Right. <laughs> it's big. Yeah, I noticed that at the time. I was like, how do they get away with that? Because, you know, if you go back far enough, it was like verboten to say the other network. It's like, you know, it's like, Dean Martin show you're watching and there, you know, we got this guy, uh, Buddy Epson on the show. He's uh, hmm, that other network, you know, it's like, you know. Oh, well, how about when they do, um, what was I watching? Oh yeah, you, you, The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. Do you see those, those um, ads on the video where they go, and you'll watch, you can watch for uh, Baba Baba on the Ed Sullivan show, which is on another network. Yeah. They yes. would never do that today. Never. So that's always that always amazed me. Interesting observation based on what you said and what we've been talking about. So Elizabeth Montgomery was kind of upset with I Dream a Genie coming in. Lee Majors yep. was upset with Bionic Woman coming in, you know, kind yep. of like uh rip-offs, as it were, for, of their show, you know, in a certain respect. Um well there was even talk, and I can't confirm this because yeah, I love Linda Carter, she's a doll. But yeah. from what Lyle Wagner or somebody told me, um, or I read it, you know, she wasn't too happy that Deborah Winger was coming on Wonder Woman, you know, yeah. as Wonder Girl. I've heard you know, that that's why I loved Wonder Girl. But yeah. when they switched to CBS and they put Wonder Woman in the 70s, you never heard from Wonder Woman or Wonder Girl again. Yeah. And by the way, for the record, I love the first season of Wonder Woman. It's, yeah. it's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. I love, <laughs> excuse me, I always like the World War II theming. Oh, yeah. And I was kind of disappointed when they brought it up to modern times, but I love Linda Carter so much. I just oh, kept Linda watching Carter, it. So, you know, she's perfect. Yes. She's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, but it, the show was not the same. Yeah. It wasn't the same. And I've interviewed on this podcast Andy Mangles, who is a big fan of Wonder Woman, who wrote a Wonder Woman book. And, uh, yeah, uh, he, he confirms basically what you say, that she wasn't too thrilled at Deborah Winger coming on as Wonder, Wonder Girl when she did. So, yeah. you know, but I can get, I can understand that. I, I, you know, I don't think Elizabeth Montgomery was probably, or was she, she probably didn't even know about it, maybe not. Uh, when they did the Tabitha show in the late 70s with oh, Lisa God. Hartman, did she? she... Did She's like, I asked her about that, I go, did you, um, what did you think of this Tabitha show? Did you like it? No! I never wanted that show to happen, she said. So, but there wasn't. She never had anything against Barbara Eden. She never had anything against Lisa Hartman. Nothing like right. that. It right. was all just a, a professional show thing. Yeah, and I think the only cast member that made the leap and was on one episode wasn't Professor Bombay. Uh, Doctor Bombay. Yeah, Doctor Bombay. Hmm, sorry, you would know. <laughs> yeah, but I think he appeared on one episode. He of... he appeared on an episode of Tabitha, and the Kravitzes did, Mister and Missus Kravitz. Oh yeah, that's true. That's and true. David White was asked to uh, to play date to Larry Tate, but he he said no because he he was upset with Bill Asher, which oh. is a whole other story. <laughs> okay. Now, um, let's see. Uh, after you did. Uh, Let's see. I think you held it up. I think your next book after that was the Life Goes On book. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So um, 
I like the show when that was on. You already explained kind of uh, why you did the book because it kind of runs the same kind of theming of the other books, which I didn't realize on your books. Um, it's not so, I guess for that, is it not so revered as the other ones, but is it might be because it's just too recent and it hasn't been rerun as much? I mean, I remember it being pretty well received at the time, um, or is it due for like some sort of revival? Like, well, first shows? of all, yeah, Kelly, Mar from what I understand, yeah. Kelly Martin and Chad Lowe are rebooting it. Okay. Um, for I don't know, they don't. I don't think they have a network. But Chad Chad Lowe's character, by the way, Chad Lowe went won an Emmy for playing Jesse McKenna, who had AIDS mm -hmm. on the show, um, and so I don't. And he died on the show. So I don't know how, I don't know if he's going to be in the reboot. I think he might be just an executive producer, but Kelly Martin's character, Becca, apparently is going to be a doctor and Chris Burke, I'm assuming is going to be, you know, some, some appearance. Well, it, the show debuted in 1989. It was the last really great family drama mm -hmm. for a long time. I mean, there's today we have, this is us and there's others. Right. But it was the last old fashioned kind of drama. Um, and it just had so much heart. They, Chris Burke's character, just like Samantha, Samantha was a woman or a, um, a, a, a woman who happened to be a witch. She wasn't a witch. She was a human being who had, she was a, a witch who happened to be a woman. There we go. She was a witch who happened to be a woman. She wasn't defined by her magic. Mm -hmm. She was a woman who happened to be, have human aspects, mm -hmm. a humanitarian, okay? So that's who we loved. We didn't love her because she was a witch. We loved her because she was Samantha. So on Life Goes On, mm -hmm. Corky, they treated him, he had Down syndrome, they treated him like there are other children on the show. He just mm -hmm. so happened to have Down syndrome. They got right. angry with him. They got upset with him, just like they would with any of their other children. And that's why this show is great, because they yep. didn't make a big deal out of Corky right. having Down syndrome. He just happened to have it. Right. And, you know, that's the big thing with the, the disabled world. You know, they those who are disabled don't want to be treated differently. They want people to talk to them and, and interact with them just like other people, because that's what they are, they're people. Right, right. Okay. It is, it's just, um, I don't know. It's a, so you've kind of answered that. It's just surprising that it didn't get a reboot or something sooner. It seems like, especially because it seems like it's right for like a Netflix show or something like that in, in yeah. today's world of streaming that, you know, that show or something similar could be coming back or something. I mean, they brought back one day at a time and things yeah. like that. So, you yeah. know, it's like, you know, and they're always bringing back and rebooting shows. And so I'm kind of shocked that, but if you're saying that they are, that's great. Yeah, so, they're yeah. they're doing it. I think, yeah, yeah they're doing it. Well, okay. they tried 9210, which that didn't work. Saved by the Bell is working, but Saved by the, by the Bell, there, every, there's this new thing, the way they do things today. And I hope they don't do this when life goes on, no. is this self-awareness, this winking at the camera. Oh yeah, we're doing a reboot. See us? We're now characters that we were. Just tell the story. Yeah, exactly. Stop with all the winking and the breaking the fourth wall. Tell the story. Yeah. Be the character. That's it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. You know, it's like, um, yeah, I don't like any of these shows. Uh, that, and I, I know this isn't quite what you're saying, but, you know, like Modern Family, where they always have to interview the uh, who are they people. talking to? Who yeah. are they talking to? Yeah, like like they're like they're in a confessional or they they have to describe the action of what's going on because the audience is so dense. I don't know. It's like just do the show. I mean, it was okay when George Burns would do it way back when on the George Burns Gracie. Or Ellen it show. was okay yeah. when 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 Harry Matt Sally did it. Okay, yeah. fine, cute. Yeah, but. That my, that's my big question. Okay, they're talking to the camera, but who are they talking to? Right. It's almost like, well, they, we got to replace that laugh track with something. Oh, let's do that. <laughs> it's like something even more annoying. I don't know. You know? 
because I'm not, I don't have a problem with laugh track. I mean, it's just like, it's just people laughing, you know, and it's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know it sounds like the same laughs every time, but I, I, I just, I like, like the applause. You know, they do that on, on Adventures of Ozzy and Harry. They applaud when a scene ends. Like, well, where are these people? Where? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, um, you mentioned Ozzy and Harry quite a bit. Is that in a possible I, book in your future? It's my new favorite show. I absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah. Is that a possible book in your future? Because I don't think there has been one. You'd have to watch no, an awful lot of episodes. I think there's like 435. Episodes. Yeah, 13 years. No, but somebody's doing, uh, somebody just published a, a biography on Ozzy. It's called The Adventures oh. of Ozzy Nelson. Oh, okay. So, no, there's not going to be any Ozzy and Harry. <laughs> not unless I get $100,000. So. Right. Um, then your next book was the book about being an NBC page. Uh Yes. Is that correct? Okay. So, um, and I don't have a copy of it right oh, now. Oh, okay. That's okay. It's, so tell me, tell me a little bit, uh, give a brief synopsis of what you did as a page and what years that was, and then how that got turned into a book. I, um, moved, as I said earlier, I moved to LA 19, uh, to be an actor, mm -hmm. but I, I went to a taping of a uh, family ties. Hmm and you know michael j fox and i was a big fan of his and, and um dogs. I, I have dogs okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um so i went to the taping and i thought geez you know that's pretty cool i was watching the pages seat the audience i'm like i think i want to do that so i stopped a page and it says i want to do what you do he goes no you don't i go yeah i really do <laughs> no you don't <laughs> <laughs> no you don't <laughs> and the job paid crap but I felt compelled. I didn't want to, he goes, you should try to be an ABC page or a CBS page. I go, no, I want to be an NBC page. That was, there was a certain prestige with it that came along with that. Mm -hmm. So I got the job like six months later, it took a long time to get that job. It's the number one entry level internship for the entertainment industry. And I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I fell in love. I made so many good friends. And some of whom I'm still friends with today. And anything that happened in the 80s in TV, I saw in person. It was great. Because everybody who was anybody came on the Johnny Carson show, which I worked a lot. Paul McCartney, Farrah Fawcett, John Travolta, whatever, whoever. Uh, Cindy Lauper. They all came through that hallway. And so years later, you know, when I became this author person, I was always telling these great stories and people would tell me, you should write a book. You should write a book. Yeah. So I did. And it was the most fun I had ever had writing a book because I didn't have to do any research. It was just all in my head. Right, right. <laughs> and it just, you know, I was telling the same stories anyway. So I was writing them down <laughs> and NBC and me, my life as a page in a book. Get it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and talk to now the I'm audience. breaking down the board. <laughs> how many now how many years again were you a page? Oh, I was a page for 18 months. Oh because that's what you're contracted at. Okay. And if they like you, they'll give you a six months extension. But you have that you get a job as a page to either move up or move out, to either oh. move up in the company. Or, you know, just do your thing, make your connections, and then move out. I wanted to be an actor, so I left. And when I first got the job, everybody, you know, my supervisors, and bought, they thought I was cocky. Go figure. And, you know, so they really gave me a hard time. And then, I, then the LA Times came along and did a, an article on pages. And I was the only positive voice in the <laughs> article. And the next day, everybody loved me. And then... Um, they wanted me to stay. And I said, you know, I appreciate the offer, but I really signed on for 18 months and I yeah. really just want to stick with that. And my supervisor, who became one of my good friends, he says, you know, no one is not only has no one ever turned down an extension, mm -hmm. but the way you did it was real classy. Mm. So they wow. went from thinking I was cocky to classy. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, you could be Johnny Dark and just be the, what was it, the oldest? I, I think it was CBS page because it was an unletterman that, that, that might be NBC. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? Cause... If I would have stayed at NBC, I probably would have been running it, but I wouldn't have done my books. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have had met all the people that I met. I wouldn't have had my show, which is, you right. know, somewhere on Amazon Prime and Amazon Prime UK and Shout Factory TV. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a big deal, my talk show. Is that Then Again with Herbie Pilato, that one? Then Again with Herbie J. Pilato. Gillette, yes. the J. I forgot the J. <laughs> no period after the J. Oh, so you're like Harry S. Truman. He doesn't have a period either after the S. or didn't. Uh, exactly, you know. <laughs> exactly. Um, one last book, and unless you're writing new ones, which we'll get into too. Um, so you wrote the biography of Mary Tyler Moore. Yes, I did. Yeah. And I'm very, very, very proud of this book. This yeah. is the paperback edition. Um, I knew Elizabeth, obviously, so it was hard for me to write objectively, although I think I did a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. With Mary, I wanted to write really objectively, to step back. I did not know her, mm-hmm. and I wanted to make this the best book I've ever written, and I think it is. Um, it, it is the first book to explore her entire life story before, during, and after the Dick Van Dyke show and the Mary Tyler Moore show. It's not just about those shows. It's about her TV movies. The last 10 years of her life, which she didn't even cover in her books, are covered in this book. And I'm so proud of it. I truly, truly am. The hardcovers um, are still available, and they will be revised, I think. And then we have the E-edition and then the paperback. So it's all, all my books are available on Amazon, or you could just email me through herbiejpilato.com or hjpilato at Yahoo and order a personally signed copy, but they're more expensive if you do it through me. But if you do it through Amazon or barnesandnoble.com, you should be good. Get the autograph. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm going to have to invest in one of those because, uh, yeah, I do have Mary's autobiography. Um, but of course, you know, I also like biographies because autobiographies, sometimes it's interesting. Uh, Autobiographies read differently than biographies, you know, and it's because biographies tend to talk about things that the person themselves don't think are important sometimes, you know, I'm not not talking about warts and all and all that stuff. I just mean just general facts about their life and stuff like that, that the average person would like to know. And the, the person that's like, eh, who cares? <laughs> yeah, they don't get it. You're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, Carol yeah. Burnett, she's written several books, yeah. but we wanted her to write a book about the Carol Burnett show. And yeah. Just talk about those episodes, do an episode guy. Somebody else did what, by the way, is a terrific yeah. book. Yeah, it's Wesley Hyatt. And he's been on oh the show too. Oh my gosh, yeah, what a, a wonderful show. book. It's a great book. Um, but, Carol but, finally did like a slim volume, a little of bit. Bed. yeah. So, and I think, uh, you know, but yeah, and Wesley's book is like the book I wanted to write because I'm a big, huge Carol Burnett show fan too. And, such a dude. I mean, everybody's job. done books that I want to do, but you know, so, part of me is like, that's the book I wanted to do. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm glad you did it because I didn't want to do it. And you did all the research, and all I have to do is sit there and read a lot it. Of work. So, yes, well, it's easier today than when I first did the Bewitch book. It was tough. Yeah. You know, I was taking, I mean, first of all, I didn't have a car. So mm-hmm. I'm taking buses to go meet Ed Juris, one of the writers, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then when I finally did get a car and I, and I met with Elizabeth, um, I put four, I bought four new tires. So I wanted my car to look nice. <laughs> I, I love it. It's no, it's no secret. I was in love with her. So, <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit about your, uh, you know, you you were on your your own show, and then you were also on the history of the sitcom, the CNN series. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think you've done a few other documentaries. You can list them off, where you've been like consultant, or you've been an on camera talent and stuff. Uh, which ones are those? Yeah. we did. Well, did Bewitched, the Easter Hollywood Story, which remains the seventh highest rated uh, Easter Hollywood story in history. I did Amy's biography of uh, of Elizabeth and David Carradine. Um, I did the TLC behind the fame series on, uh, Mary Tyler Moore and Bob Newhart mm-hmm. did, um, 
Bravo's 100 Greatest TV Characters five part series <laughs> on that. That was fun. I was served as a producer as well as a cultural commentator, they call them. Mm -hmm. um but yeah the c the cnn show is pretty cool they were so nice to me yeah People i still need to see it because it's still on cnn and it's one of the i don't have cable i just have streaming channels so yeah i keep yeah, playing I please bring it over to amazon prime or yeah. netflix or something yeah. you know or dvd yeah. or something i'm like that ah, mm -hmm. you know <laughs> now they were real nice to me they were real nice to me on that show there's a lot of experts that they use you know i wasn't the yeah. i wasn't the only one a lot of really terrific ones. So. Yeah, I know a few others have been on the show, and I'm just waiting. I know eventually they will move it to a different format at some or a different platform at some point. They've got to. I wouldn't think they would just leave it there. But no. you know, um, I know they're like rerunning it now. I think is the thing too, and so they have to get their mileage out of it. I get it. So, <laughs> anyway. but uh, yeah, that's all the stuff I really love. So um, at this point. Is there any uh, book projects or yes. podcast projects or uh, film projects you're working on that you can disclose? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm working on three new books. Okay. One on Sean Connery, which mm. is just about done, and Diana Rigg. Mm. And then a third book <laughs> about um, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. And that's going to be a combined book about their life, their their partnership and their top movies i mean there's a lot of books out there about them but not one combined book about them and their and their their top films in mm -hmm. one right. in one volume so i'm excited about all of that and a couple other projects uh that i'm not allowed to speak of it yeah the that's what that's why <laughs> no you um, must give the scoop here no i'm just kidding you know it's like but if you're free to discuss at least the ones you mentioned that's really great so yeah you know um uh, on those ones like Diana Rigger, is it basically her whole life or is it focused more on oh, the definitely. Avengers or how, how does that work? No, it's a Sean, it's going to be Sean Connery's entire life okay. and Richard DiMarco, who is one of his closest friends growing up in Scotland, has written the foreword and has granted interviews, has, as have many uh, associated with him, which I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. Diana Rigg, I talked to uh, Patrick McNee's son. Mm -hmm. Um, who was granted an interview and I'm doing them in a row so Sean Connery's almost done I'm kind of doing Diana once I'm done with Sean in about a month I'm going to go full throttle into Diana and then I'll go on to Spielberg Lucas after that and they're due just in in rows as well 22 23 24 yeah, so that's kind of like how I work on things too yeah. <laughs> But, you can't do it all at once this is great. no no but i shift around i'm working on a mad magazine book and i work oh. on it for the better part of this year and now i'm taking a break from it because i literally went through every single issue and was uh writing copious notes and everything like that wow. so i just needed to take a break you know and then i'll, I'll go back to it and wow. need to do a few more interviews but you know uh, i told people it's probably the biggest most ambitious project i've ever worked on because you're covering 70 years plus of material whereas everything else i've worked on is like 40 years 20 years that's 10 gonna years, be a years. hit yeah that's gonna so, be a hit that but, book's gonna do well but i'm taking my time with it i'm not just rushing it just to say get it done you know so if everybody wants it this year it's not gonna come out this year <laughs> but anyway enough on me um and uh is there anything else you'd like to plug or anything like that at this time you know one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life, and this is really nothing to do with the entertainment industry, but me as a person. I last before the pandemic, I started uh, do donating and um, my time to uh, the homeless ministry at my church, and it was one of the most amazing things I've done. And they just started to do it again, so I'm excited to get back in there and, and get out uh, and help people who are hungry and have you know sleep on the cement. And that really is the most fulfilling thing, most fulfilling thing I've ever done. I mean that with my whole heart. I love the entertainment industry. I love publishing. I love to write. I love being on TV, you know, but, and I, and I try to, and you've seen my posts. I try to be very positive uh, in my posts and in my public views. I try not to, to focus on the negative. It's not as though I don't stub my toe and swear and, <laughs> and you know, and get angry. I just try to take the high road 
when I'm in a, a platform like this because yeah. I want to be, you know, an example. Yeah. You know. Um, so yeah, I I have a very full life regarding you know the uh, the combination of career and things to do, and my life is more fulfilled when I do donate my time and and, and efforts beyond work to things like helping the homeless and any kind of charity work. I try to be a good person, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not perfect. None of us are. Elizabeth wasn't, Mary wasn't, nobody's right. perfect. Okay. Right. We're all human, but I try to wake up every day and say, well, okay, how can I make this world a little bit better? You know, what kind of, what can I do to make someone smile? And, you know, cause I'm always looking for someone to make me smile. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe other people want to smile too. And people respond to it. And we need it, you know what, today more than ever. Yeah. It's just so horrible the way things are. Everybody's yeah. so divisive. I don't talk about politics on my yeah. page. I don't talk about religion. <laughs> you know, yeah. I keep it light. And, yeah. and people know this too. The minute anybody starts talking about politics on my Facebook page or wherever, they're deleted. You know, the <laughs> comment is, and if they do it again, they're gone. Yeah. I am guilty of doing politics, uh, but not in recent times. So I'll leave it at that. But uh, I rarely have ever ventured out of my own space to do it. You know, I figured that's somebody else's space. Like if I was on your page, I wouldn't suddenly bring up something because that's your domain. You know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, similar to you, you know, yes, I do have life uh, outside just writing books and uh, doing podcasts and things like that. Um, you know, my, my career that I rarely talk about on this show is currently in healthcare and I'm working with uh, behavioral health. And uh, um, basically I'm behind the scenes. I'm not really a, a, a therapist or anything like that, but, you know, I do more of the behind the scenes work, the administrative stuff. And so, you know, I really enjoy that. That's one reason why we do these podcasts at the end of the day instead of like, because I didn't have to come from work. So, you know. Good for you. Good for you. That That's terrific. See, that's terrific. You're a jovial soul and you're bringing your light into the world too. I was a primary caregiver to both my parents for 13 years. Okay. So that's kind of when things changed anyway. You know, I started focusing on the writing, the TV acting and all of that kind of fell by the wayside. My parents didn't have any money. You know, it's not like I was going to get some big estate by taking mm -hmm. care of them. I took care of them because I loved them. Yeah. And, um, you know, and they're now, the way I look at it, they're helping me now in ways that they weren't able to help me when they were on earth. That's mm -hmm. what I look at it as. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a senior activities director at various um, senior complexes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I love seniors too. That's my other thing. So <laughs> now that I'm becoming one. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> For me, it's like I was kind of more interested in healthcare, you know, because of, you know, the conversations in in the world in the last 10 years. I mean, you know, with the Affordable Care Act and things like that. And that's what kind of steered me towards that. And then, of course, with the pandemic, it's like, you know, they talk about frontline workers. Well, I'm not really uh, skilled and necessarily to be, you know, you know, a, <laughs> a surgeon or whatever, or a medic or something like that. But I certainly can be associated with it where, you know, I'm doing something to help the right. field that I make my contribution that way. Right. Well, you're making a contribution now. You're, you're making oh, yeah. a lot of people happy who, yeah. you know, with this podcast, you have your followers, you're making people smile. Don't, don't think that that doesn't make a difference because it does. Oh, I, I know that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, because I've always said that, I, you know, I, for years I did sales and I worked in advertising and newspapers and things like that. And I said, how did, you know, the only time I could ever do anything, sales or anything I did, customer service, I always felt I had to be helping somebody. So if I'm doing advertising for newspapers back in the day, uh, you know, it was helping somebody promote their business. So that's, uh, you know, in the case of writing books now, it's, it's I'm helping somebody become educated about a subject I like, you know, be it Harvey Comics, be it Dennis Menace, be it the Beatles, the Monkees, whatever I've written about, you know, things like that. and you know, I hope you feel that way with your books, you know, that you're educating somebody about Bewitched, you're educating somebody about Life Goes uh, yeah, On, Six was, Million Dollar was, Man, whatever, you know. That was one of the things that I, I set out to do. I didn't want to just, just do trivia books. Yeah. I wanted to do books about shows that meant something. And I wanted it not just to be an episode guide, but, you know, my books start out, like you were saying, you know, they have a narrative of the history 
and then it has biographies of the stars, and then it has an episode guide. Yeah. Some books are just the episode guide, which right. is okay, but yeah. that's not what I wanted my books to be. Right. I always want a little bit more too. And that's why I've used your book. And like I said, I mentioned Steve Cox and I can't remember the other ones, but the authors like that, that uh, did books that were kind of a model of how to do what I like to read. That's what I want to produce, you know, as a writer. So, you know, <laughs> that's all. Well, I got to say that, I, and I forgot to tell this, it's important. When I was 10 years old, I bought, or 11, there was that book called The World of Star Trek. Remember that book by yeah. David Gerald? Yeah. I bought it at a supermarket and I was with my parents and they went out to the car and left me and said, don't worry, buy the book and come on out. And, and I got to the clerk and the book was 90 cents and all I had was 80 cents. Oh, man. So there was this beautiful elderly woman in a wheelchair in front of me. She goes, what's wrong, honey? I go, I, I just I don't have it. She took one of the little pocketbook. She gave me a dime. And I bought that book, The World of Star Trek, and I held it in my hand. And I swear to you, I said, one day I'm going to write about the witch like this guy wrote about Star Trek. And David Gerald, I told him that story years later, and it, it touched him. And David I love, Gerald, you know, I love that book, too. I think he's a Facebook friend of mine, too. I mean, he, and he wrote great stuff for Land of the oh, Lost, oh. And, you know, and the Star Trek cartoon show and everything else. And, you know, and. You know, it, even if he just did the Tribbles episode, which is, you know, he's done a lot right. more than that, you know, he'd still be revered, you know, <laughs> so. <Right. laughs> brilliant, brilliant writer. Yep, yep. All right. Well, um, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, if there's Thank anything, you. if anybody can get a hold of you, uh, is Facebook the best way to get a hold of you? You can, you know, follow me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Come If you, uh, you want to order one of my books again, go to Herbie J. Pilato dot com um or email me at hjpilato at yahoo.com and uh there you go and any personal appearances i know the pandemic's kind of knocked that out for a while but in 2022 are you going to be out there promoting your books at all or uh well probably with the sean book i will that won't that won't be for a while though okay so but i'm working like i said i'm working on these other things that are hush hush right now okay, okay. So we may see you like in 2023 out in the out and about. <laughs> yeah. Well, you may see me on something in 2022 on television. Okay. But you won't see personal appearances for a while. Okay, that's fine. All right. I always have every, want everybody to plug whatever they're doing. As, Thank as you best so they much. Can. Yeah. You're such a wonderful host. You're and you're so affable and likable, and that is important. Uh, we're talking about sitcoms and what makes a sitcom a hit: likability. Yeah. And, and you got that dude so congratulations Thank you. and i use and i've said this on the podcast before i use johnny carson as my model you know it's like you know he you know everybody says how did johnny carson talk to everybody and be an expert well he wasn't really an expert what do you do is ask the question you sit back and listen and if that's somebody right. said something you honed in on that and ask a follow-up you know so that's what i try to do instead of interrupting interjecting i mean occasionally i'll put my own spin on something but I want you to talk. It's your, it's you're the guest. You, know? you are so right. You look at the Today Talk shows besides me, but if you look at Today Talk shows, every first of all, everybody does a talk show today just to plug something, not yeah. even to talk. There's no yeah. conversation. Everything's yeah. joke, 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 joke. Yeah. And I and I do have episodes like that. So if, I mean, if you ever want to be back on the show, and the, you know, we could just do an hour just talking about we witched or whatever. You know, I'd love it. We'll, I'd we'll love to it. come back. I'd all love right. it. Well, thank you very much, Herbie. And that pretty much wraps up another Fun Ideas podcast. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful year. All right. Have a great 2022, everybody. <laughs>